Welcome to our worship for Sunday the 11th of October. It's good to be with you today as we talk of visions and banquets. And so, our call to worship. Lord God, faithful and loving, we do not always feel like rejoicing, even as we gather to worship you. Our minds are sometimes distracted and elsewhere, weighed down by the burdens of our lives. So help us in this moment to find it within our hearts to rejoice in your constancy and your loving care for us. People of God, let us rejoice. Amen. And that is exactly what we shall try to do as we sing our opening hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King, which is number 243 in hymns and psalms. Now come to a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we never know what the future holds or where life will take us next. We never know what is just around the corner and what the outcome of things will be. But we know that whatever follows on from this moment, you are here with us by our side, above and beneath us, entwining your life with ours surpassing all human understanding. In this moment, bless us and awaken us to your abiding presence. Eternal God, so often we give up if something goes wrong or doesn't go our way. So often we are overwhelmed by our own problems that we forget to look out for others. So often we are consumed with negatives and endings, that we lose sight of the positives and beginnings. 
eternal God. Forgive us for our self-centeredness, our blindness and our deafness to both you and those around us, and reawaken your spirit within us. As we turn to you, saying sorry for all the wrong we have done and the many good things that we should have done, as we turn to you looking for a, a new direction in our lives, as we turn to you in true repentance, we too can hear those words of comfort. Your sins are forgiven. Let us know this truly in our hearts and in our lives. And so, for eternal hope that comes from you, Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your gentleness and compassion. We give you thanks and praise for your peace within. We give you thanks and praise for your light in the darkness. We give you thanks and praise for hope when all seems hopeless. We give you thanks and praise for love beyond measure. We give you thanks and praise. Amen. And so we come to our first reading, which comes from the book of Isaiah. Our first reading is from Isaiah, chapter 25, reading verses 1 to 9. Yahweh, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will confess your name. Because you have done something extraordinary. Plans from a distant time, truthfulness, truth. Because you've made out of a town a heap, a fortified township into a ruin. The citadel of foreigners is no longer a town. It won't be built up ever. Therefore, a vigorous people will honor you. A township of violent nations will revere you. Because you've been a stronghold for the poor person. A stronghold for the needy person in his pressures, a shelter from rain, a shade from heat. When the spirit of the violent was like winter rain, the din of aliens like heat in the desert, you subdue the heat with a cloud shade. The music of the violent succumbs. And Yahweh of armies will make for all peoples on this mountain a banquet with rich foods, a banquet with aged wines, juicy, rich foods, refined, aged wines. He will swallow up on this mountain the layer of wrapping, the wrapping over all the peoples, the covering that is spread out over all the nations. He will have swallowed up death permanently. The Lord Yahweh will wipe the tears from on all faces, the reviling of his people. He will take away from on all the earth, because Yahweh is the one who has spoken. On that day one will say, There, this is our God. We hoped for him, and he delivered us. This is Yahweh. We hoped for him. Let's celebrate and rejoice in his deliverance. Thanks be to God. And so we come to our second hymn today, which is number 402 in Hymns and Psalms, for the healing of the nations.
We now have our second reading for today. The reading is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, reading verses 1 to 14. Our Gospel reading for this morning comes from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, reading from verses 1 to 14. And this is the parable of the wedding feast. Jesus spoke to them again in parables. The kingdom of heaven, he said, is like a king who made a wedding feast for his son. He sent his slaves to call the invited guests to the wedding, and they didn't want to come. Again, he sent out other slaves with those instructions. Say to the guests, look, I've got my dinner ready. My bulls and my fatted calves have been killed. Everything is prepared. Come to the wedding. But they didn't take any notice. They went off, one to his own farm, another to see to his business. The others laid hands on his slaves, abused them and killed them. The king was angry and sent his soldiers to destroy those murderers and burn down their city. Then he said to the slaves, the wedding is ready. But the guests didn't deserve it. So go to the roads leading out of the town and invite everyone to you find to come to the wedding. The slaves went off into the streets and rounded up everyone they found, both good and bad alike. And the wedding was filled with party-goers. And when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who wasn't wearing a wedding suit. My friend, he said to them, how did you get here without a wedding suit? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, tie him up, hands and feet, and throw him into the darkness outside, where people weep and grind their teeth. Many are called, but few are chosen. Thanks be to God for his word. Through the written word and the spoken word, may we know your living word, Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. There is a story of a, a church pastor who was invited with his family for Easter dinner at the Wilson home. Mrs. Wilson was, was widely known for her amazing culinary contributions to a variety of church occasions, and everyone was seated around the table as the food was, was being served. As usual, it was a feast for the eyes, the nose and the palate. When the pastor's youngest son, Peter, received his plate, he started eating straight away. Peter, wait until we say grace, insisted his embarrassed father. I don't have to, the five-year-old replied. Of course you do, Peter, his mother insisted, rather forcefully. We always say a prayer before eating at our house. That's at our house, Peter explained. But this is Mrs Wilson's house, and she knows how to cook. Of course, 2020 has not been a year when visiting people for a meal has featured in our daily, weekly or even monthly lives. You know, how many parties, celebrations, weddings, wakes have been cancelled or severely curtailed as we've been under various degrees of lockdown over the last six or seven months. In our first reading from the book of Isaiah, we hear of a remarkable vision. This section of the book of Isaiah is talking of a, a judgment on the nations, a final age of both judgment and promise. In chapter 25, the prospect of God's ultimate victory is celebrated in a psalm of praise. Those who had been hostile to God's people will be brought low, and the poor and needy, the afflicted people of God, will be raised up and protected. Like a king holding his coronation feast, the Lord of hosts gathers the nations for a rich feast. Mourning will end, death will be overcome and tears wiped away as hostility to the people of God from those around will be removed. And the response from the people will be a confession of faith and of rejoicing at God's saving power. It is a vision of a new beginning 
a new life. Isaiah draws a distinction between those who gave refuge to the poor and needy and those who were ruthless. In our Gospel reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the setting moves from the vineyard covered last week to a wedding banquet given by a king for his son. Two groups of slaves are sent to call the invited guests. It follows the usual Palestinian fashion where an invitation would be issued in, in two parts. First, there was a preliminary announcement that the feast was being planned. This would be followed some time later by a further announcement that the preparations were now complete and the time and place of the wedding set. Well, it seems that those invited did not take the first part of the invitation seriously. They continued with the routine of their lives, one going back to his farm and another to his business. Others abused and murdered the servants, sent with the invitation. At this, the king sends his troops to burn and destroy their city. Perhaps this refers to the future domination of Israel and in particular the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Romans. Those who were initially invited have proved unworthy. So now the king instructs the servants to go everywhere, gathering up people to come to the feast. There is a wide response and the wedding hall is full of guests. Yet still there is a warning. The king spies one who is there, but not appropriately dressed. The one who failed to wear the wedding garment of righteousness will be cast into the inner or the outer darkness. Many are indeed invited, but few are chosen. In both these readings a feast is involved, a feast to be looked forward to. In both readings there is a warning. The judgment in the book of Isaiah is reserved for those who, who fail to look after the poor and needy. And in the book of Matthew, it is for those who fail to wear the clothing of righteousness. As I was writing this sermon, I found out that a friend and ex-colleague had become another of the victims of coronavirus. Two days before, Steve had been on social media posting his usual humorous and, well, perhaps often rude posts and pictures of his adventures and his travels, often accompanied by a picture of the ice creams or the full English breakfast that he consumed as he went. But within two days, the virus had taken him, a reminder that life and future plans can so easily be changed with little notice. Of course... Much of normal life has had to stop or change over the last six months. Unfortunately, that has also been the case with much of our church life. We've managed to preserve an, an online presence, providing video or audio services for those who have wished to receive them. Some of us have been able also to maintain a ministry to the bereaved through providing funerals. And I know many ministers have also been continuing with a pastoral ministry, phoning or, or visiting members of the church in a socially distanced way. Yet the perception in much of our world is that church is closed. Indeed, the signs that have been placed on, on many church doors and notice boards have said as much. Yet God's love, God's presence, and most importantly God's work, does and must continue. Clearly, we must be safe, we must look after the vulnerable and frail members of our community by providing safe and socially distanced worship for those who wish to come through our doors. And we must also provide online worship for those who do not yet feel able to be with us physically. But the perception outside our doors is that of a church and by implication a God who has retreated away from the danger. A God who is not concerned with the current crisis and the struggles of the many, who now more and more fall into the category of poor and needy. Colin, our minister, reported to us last week on the statement by some of the funeral directors he works with that more and more people were now seeking non-religious funerals as they felt that the church had abandoned them through this crisis. This 
is not our God. This is not the God revealed to us in Jesus, fully involved in a troubled world, engaging with the poor and needy, bringing healing and peace and, yes, judgment. A God who responds to need with love and grace. A God concerned for others. Perhaps we, like many others during this crisis, have been guilty of looking inward, of becoming rather self-obsessed. So looking forward, many churches are now turning their attention to the up-and-coming festivals, All Saints, All Souls, Remembrance and Advent. Then, of course, we have the Christmas period. What will it say of our churches and our message if the Christ of Christmas is kept hidden in closed buildings? What will it say if the darkness of coronavirus and all its consequences is allowed to dim the light of the Christmas message? In the final reading that was set for today, one that we've not heard this morning, but Paul is preparing to sign off his letter to the Philippians. Paul writes from prison. We are not sure exactly where or when, but it does seem likely that Paul was aware that the Philippians may well not see him again. There are issues in Philippi as anywhere, and Paul spends some time encouraging Sisygus, his loyal companion, to help them sort out the problems. He then turns his attention to pointing them in the right direction regarding their future conduct. It is here, perhaps, that we can perhaps learn of a way forward in our own current predicament. As we look forward instead of back, as we look to the time perhaps when all our current troubles are over. Looking forward, we must not forget that we are the body of Christ now. In Philippians it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And so may we truly, as we pray and seek to be present with God and receive guidance from God, may we truly feel the peace of God, a peace that's not there to make us feel better, but a peace that gives us the courage and the strength to do the right thing, a peace centred on Christ and focused on finding new ways of doing his work, a peace that disturbs the disturbed world around us and begins the work of setting it right, a peace that shows us new ways of being and new ways of being the church, Christ's body, in a sometimes dark and dangerous world. Amen. And so now we come to a time of prayer, a time to let God speak to us as we offer our intercessions for those in need. Let us pray. O God, we come to pray not for ourselves but for each other, for those we know and for those we don't, for situations we understand and for those that confound us. The news tells us of trauma and heartache across the world and as we try to grasp the intensity of it all we pray for those affected by the current pandemic. We pray for those whose lives have been cut short by the virus, those who have suffered loss and who grieve their passing, those whose health has been affected in a bad way. We pray for those working in our health services, 
those caring for the sick and the suffering and for the dying. We pray for those who are preparing for the coming months with all the uncertainty and worry that they bring. We pray for those searching for vaccines and for those involved in the testing and the trialling of them. Those scientists trying to understand the virus and its effects. We pray for those who are essential to the functioning of our society. We give thanks for their strength and commitment through the days that have passed. We pray for their continued strength in the days ahead. We pray for those who are working and those without work that they may never lose that sense of purpose and value that we need as humans. We pray for those who are isolated or alone, those without a safe space to be themselves. We pray for the many young people away for the first time at university or college in lockdown situations. Those first days, weeks and months can be a challenging time in normal circumstances. It is hard to imagine what it is like at the moment. We pray for those areas of our country where the virus is on the rise, strengthen the resolve of all who live there to do the best they can, to work together, to find common solutions and to support each other in the trying times ahead. We pray for decision makers at all levels in our society and nation that decisions may be taken for the common good and never for narrow personal or political ends. And we now look further afield to the world in which we live. The advent of the coronavirus has shown us our common humanity. There have been no barriers of race, religion, background or political view to those it has affected. It affects us all. Yet the weakest, the poorest and the most disadvantaged are the ones who have been affected the most. And so show us, Lord, how we can make the world a fairer and a more equal place, working with our fellow humans across the globe. These prayers we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so now we come to our final hymn. How should we respond to the fact that we are forgiven and that our God will surely stand alongside us in our present difficulties? We must surely respond with praise and thanksgiving, and so we shall. Our final hymn today, today is that hymn of thanksgiving and praise. Now thank we all our God.
Well, thank you for joining us for our worship today. We now come to our final prayer. Let us pray. We go our separate ways, Lord, perhaps with smiles or frowns, with our hopes and with fears, with answers, but also with questions, maybe crying and with heavy hearts, or with anxieties or relief. We go our separate ways, Lord, but we never go alone. With thankful hearts, we share the journey of life with each other and with you. Be with us as we go. And we say together the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.